Hey everybody, put on my jacket, felt something in my pocket. Turns out to be the prayer that I offered up in Congress recently that kind of set the world on fire here in America. What could be so wrong about this? Stay tuned, we're gonna analyze it. Real Life presents the Jack Hibbs Podcast. With intention and boldness to proclaim truth, equip the saints and impact our culture. Today, if this podcast lifts you up and encourages you to live a more fulfilled life in Christ, then make sure you leave us one of those five-star ratings. To us, that's like saying amen or yes. Then that rating will encourage others to listen. Now open your hearts to what God's Word has to say to you. Here is Jack Hibbs. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to this podcast, and we're really glad that you're with us. And this is, listen, this is going to be something that is really um, uh in my lane. I love this. And the reason why I love it about um, the topic that we're going to be talking about today is because it's it's not only something that is currently going on in my life, uh, but it has affected other people. But the reason why it's so thrilling to me, it's so exciting to me is is because it's biblically based and it is historically accurate and it is relevant now. Where do you get a chance to say such things? That is something that is biblically accurate that is historically um, relevant and true, and that it is happening right now in our lives. And that is, of course, because of the nature of truth. And more specifically, here we are uh, way past January 30th when I was asked to offer up the prayer to the United States Congress, which I thought would make... um, Uh, no bump in the road at all because it was a biblically based prayer. And I actually uh, pulled it out of the jacket. I was wearing this suit and I literally found this five minutes ago in my suit jacket. So here it is, the actual prayer in Congress. And um, what's interesting is the fact that uh, it was pretty run of the mill. Uh, What I didn't take into consideration is how incredibly far our Congress has fallen from being educated in American history and a Judeo-Christian biblical worldview. So let me first of all start off by saying what I was asked a moment ago uh, in a television uh, program with uh, Dr. Sebastian Gorka. Uh, Gorka asked me, should Christians be involved in the public square? And um, I gave him a resounding overwhelming yes, that I believe we are commanded, commanded. You say, Pastor, aren't you going to back down from being attacked for talking about me, Christians being involved in politics and all that stuff? Nope, because you're asking me if that's you. You're asking me to disobey the Bible. Well, my pastor says we shouldn't talk about who's running for office or Proposition LMNOP or, uh, you know, this bill or that thing. Well, that pastor needs to repent, dear friends. I mean it. And here's the reason why, because God means it. Jeremiah. (laughs) Just dawned on me. Some of you are going to say, Jeremiah? Well, that's not in the New Testament. Yeah, well, the first century church didn't have a New Testament Bible, did they? The first century church had an Old Testament. That's all they had. And they... They did a lot better than we're doing. So think about that. Um, Jeremiah 29, 7. Seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to dwell and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. Seek the welfare of the city where you live. God says, if you do that, your city will be at peace and people will enjoy peace. That's the command of the Lord. Didn't Jesus say to us, let your light so shine before men? That's the world. That's your city. That when they see your good works, they'll glorify your Father which is in heaven. That's a reference to the day of judgment, by the way. More accurately put, Jesus said, let your light so shine, the gospel light, the light that I've given you, which we have no light of our own. Jesus said, let your light, the light I put within you, let it shine before an unbelieving world that surrounds you, that in the day of judgment, they'll give glory to God because they're going to have to confess that what you told them way back when in 2024, that you were correct, even though we hated you for saying it, 
we now give glory to God in the day of judgment before we're carted off away into eternity, either good, bad, or ugly, left or right, up and down, heaven or hell. Before they go off into eternity, they will have to agree that the light that you were shining was biblical light. And so I offered up this prayer that has caused 26 members of Congress to file a condemnation letter to call House Speaker Mike Johnson into question and to change the vetting process of the United States uh, chaplaincy program to keep lunatics like me out of the Capitol. Does it matter uh, that I pay taxes? It doesn't matter that I vote. It doesn't matter that I pray for our country. I am the problem. And you want to know why I'm the problem? Because of this. On Tuesday, January 30th, this is what transpired in our nation's capital in the opening of the 118th Congress. I prayed. Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Turns out I wasn't supposed to say that. Together we come before you in humility. I insulted people because I suggested by saying that, that some people are arrogant. As a people in need of your uh, forgiveness and your mercy and your goodness and your grace, I insinuated that we needed to repent by saying forgiveness. For these past 250 years, our fathers in this Congress have prayed for your guidance and protection. And so I stand here in humility, in this, or in humble petition, I should say, that you today might do the same. That this nation and its unparalleled constitution, see, that's a problem because our unparalleled constitution suggests that we are a constitutional republic. Democrats cannot say the word constitution. And they can, you'll never hear a Democrat say republic. They can't say constitutional republic, which is what we are. We're not a democracy. We are a constitutional republic. Wow. So that this nation and its unparalleled constitution, your great gift to all freedom loving people, might be renewed here and across this land as a beacon of hope to all who seek peace. I ask you today, Father, to bring to us a great awakening of righteousness and confidence in you, who alone is mighty to save. Hear my cry in this hour of great need that we might be humbled before you in true repentance, in repentance, of our national sins that went over like a ton of bricks. You almighty God are the source of all wisdom and there is no wisdom, but that which comes from you. So please come upon those here who are stewards over the business of our nation. Oh, that's a fact, you know, with your wisdom, which comes from above with your holy fear Oh boy, that word fear drove those in the media into a frenzy. You should read the stuff that's out there about this fiery fear-mongering prayer. <laughs> the word fear, by the way, in biblical context, that, that we would be a people uh, that would conduct ourselves before God's holy fear would, means awe and reverence. But you have to you have to not go to college to know what that means. Okay. Knowing that your coming day of judgment draws near when all who have been and are now in authority will answer to the judge of heaven and earth for the decisions that they have made here. I offer this prayer to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our crucified Savior and resurrected Lord. Amen. So I was out of bounds. I was, I was a crazy nationalist, Christian, fanatic, whack nut. This guy needs to be banned. To this moment, I do not know if I can actually fly into Reagan 
National Airport. I don't know if I can get into BWI. I don't know if I can fly into Dulles, Dulles Airport there in D.C. Uh, because there's people so angry at me over that prayer. The Bible says, seek the peace where you live. I took that out of Chino Hills to the, our nation's capital because behind me it said, in God we trust. And in front of me, Moses' pictures, Moses' etching is on the wall and it says Moses. So listen, just, we're going to pause right now. Take, take a listen to what it really came down. The house will be in order. The prayer will be offered by the guest chaplain, Pastor Jack Hibbs, Calvary Chapel, Chino Hills, Chino, California. Let's pray. Almighty God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, together we come before you in humility as a people in need of your forgiveness, your mercy, your goodness, and your grace. For these 250 so years, our fathers in this Congress have prayed for your guidance and protection. And so we stand here in humble petition that you today might do the same, that this nation and its unparalleled constitution, your great gift to all freedom-loving people, might be renewed here and across this land as a beacon of hope to all who seek peace. I ask you today, Father, to bring to us a great awakening of righteousness and confidence in you, who alone is mighty to save. Hear my cry in this hour of great need that we might be humbly blessed before you in the repentance of our national sins. You, almighty God, are the source of all wisdom, and there is no wisdom but that which comes from you. So please come upon those here who are the stewards over the business of our nation with your wisdom which comes from above and with your holy fear knowing that your coming day of judgment draws near when all who have been and are now in authority will answer to you, the great judge of heaven and of earth, for the decisions that they make here in this place. I offer this prayer to you, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, and our crucified Savior and resurrected Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So in light of that, milk toast prayer of mine is pretty weak. You might thought, oh, no, 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 that was crazy. No, listen, John Adams, John Adams, I quote John Adams. And finally, I recommend that the said day, the duties of humiliation and prayer be accompanied by fervent thanksgiving to the bestower, capital B, bestower, of every good gift, not only for having hitherto protected and preserved the people of these United States in the independent enjoyment of their religious and civil freedom, but also having proposed, I'm, I'm sorry, having prospered them in a wonderful progress of population and for conferring on them many and great favors conducive to the happiness and prosperity of our nation. Given under my hand the seal of the United States of America at Philadelphia this 23rd day of March in the year of our Lord, 1,798, and of the independence of the said states, the 22nd. This is an excerpt from Adam's Proclamation of Humiliation, Fasting, and Prayer from 1798. Poor John Adams. He didn't know that 26 members of Congress later on would so be disgusted with the thought of the one true biblical God being represented in the House of the United States Congress that they would have had him banned. They would have had this dude John Adams, the nation he gave birth to, thrown out. 
How about George Washington? George Washington, quote, when you speak of God or his attributes, let it be seriously in reverence, honor, and obey your natural parents, although they be poor. This is rule number 108 written in Washington's own hand in his 110 rules of civility and decent behavior in company and conversations written at the age of 15. I want to read that again. He says at the age of 15, and I quote, when you speak of God or his attributes, let it be seriously and reverently and honor and obey your parents, your natural parents, although they be poor. Age 15. Quote, bless our rulers in church and state. Bless, O Lord, the whole race of mankind. And let the world be filled with the knowledge of thee and thy son, Jesus Christ. Pity the sick, the poor, the weak, the needy, the widows, and the fatherless. And all that mourn or are broken in heart. And be merciful to them according to their several necessities. Bless my friends and grant me grace to forgive my enemies as heartedly as I desire forgiveness of thee, my heavenly father. I beseech thee to defend me this night from all evil and do more for me than I can think or ask for Jesus Christ's sake in whose most holy name and words, I continue to pray, O Father, written in 1752 on page 24 of George Washington's personal prayer book diary. Again, Almighty God, we make our earnest prayer that thou wilt keep the United States in thy holy protection that thou wilt incline thine hearts of the citizens to cultivate a spirit of subordination and obedience to government and entertain a brotherly affection and love for one another and for their fellow citizens of the United States at large. Amazing, isn't it? And particularly their brethren who have served in the field. He's referring to the field of battle. Oh, gosh, now he's a Christian nationalist warlord. And finally, that thou wilt most graciously be pleased to dispose us all to do justice, to love mercy, and to demean ourselves with that charity, humility, and pacific temper of mind, which were the characteristics of the divine author of our blessed religion. And without a humble imitation, yeah, and without a humble imitation of whose example in these things, we can never hope to be a happy nation. Grant our supplication, we beseech thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. General George, excuse me, President Washington's Prayer for America inscribed on a plaque at uh, Pohak Church where he was a vestryman from 1762 to 1784. I quote again, And now, Almighty Father, if it is thy holy will, that we shall obtain a place and a name among the nations of the earth. Grant that we may be enabled to show our gratitude for thy goodness by our endeavors to fear, to fear and obey thee. Bless us with thy wisdom in our counsels, success in battle, and let all our victories be tempered with humility. Endow also our enemies with, listen to this, with enlightened minds 
and they be, that they become sensible of their injustice and willing to restore our liberty and peace. Grant the petition of thy servant for the sake of him who thou hast called thy beloved son. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. May 1st, 1777, on the news of French having joined the colonies in the war against England. I quote, The hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that has not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. Letter to General Thomas Nelson, August 20th, 1778. Did you hear what he just said? This is from Washington. You are a reprobate, nincompoop, ignorant, dum dum, if you do not recognize that God's hand has been upon us. You say, where does it say that? He says you're worse than an infidel if you don't recognize the good hand of God upon us. Wow. 26 members of Congress, so ignorant and blind of the American history, and those people are in power. They are the ones that you have elected to represent you. And ignorant people of American history have commandeered this country with stupidity. So listen, I could keep going on. This is These are just two examples. You, you have not even... You haven't even heard me begin to quote John Jay, the, su the first Supreme Court Justice of the United States Supreme Court. J John Jay said that we should only elect Christians to office. Did you know that? Who said that? The Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. John Jay. We could go on and on about this stuff. My point is this, friends. That we have become so ignorant. T Listen, if you think I'm being mean right now, ask yourself this question. When was the last time you sat down with your kid or your grandkid and, and did some homework with them about American history and about things like this? That this is what Washington said in um, lower Manhattan on uh, at the corner of Broad and Wall Streets. Do you know what happened there? Why is there a gigantic statue of Washington on the corner of Broadway? And Wall Street in lower Manhattan. Do you know? You should know. You should know what happened there. Your kids should know. If you live in America, you should know this. Why, for example, does Mount Rushmore display four presidential faces? For what significance are those names on that mountain in Mount Rushmore, South Dakota? What's all, what is that all about? Why is it? that I own a book that I bought from Mount Vernon souvenir shop, right, in Virginia at Mount Vernon, George Washington's home. And it's a book that's about this thick and it cost me over 300 bucks and it's titled, it's a huge title, but I'll come close. Clergy and Pastors, Prayers and Sermons During the Revolutionary Period. It's a collection of sermons and prayers. If I read those sermons and prayers, well, first of all, you'd get saved if you heard them. Second of all, you'd say, wow, what's with that? Do you guys understand something real quick as we wrap this up? Um, we're so far willf willfully ignorant so far from our nation's truth that we don't even know what country we live in anymore. And we're okay with that. When very, 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 very evil people want to hide and keep you from being educated about your American experience as a citizen in this country. Something's wrong. 
Because if you dive into the true story of American history, you can't get away from God. He's everywhere. So not too long ago, as I wrapped this up, it became vogue to tear down statues. I'm wondering if you know, by the way, we have more stat. I'm, I'm going to mention a person who is the most enshrined individual in the United States by statue than anybody else. Take a guess. I'll give you the count of five. Take a guess. Just shout it out wherever you're at. Pick anybody uh, that you think would meet this. The most, the most enshrined statue individual in American, on, on American soil. Five, four, three, two, one. And the answer is? Nope. Christopher Columbus. That was true until BLM came into power. And wokeism hit the streets. They've taken down a bunch of them. There were, there were almost 700 statues of Christopher Columbus throughout our nation. Did you know that in California, the governor had the statue of Christopher Columbus removed from our state capitol and carted away? You can watch it on YouTube. My point is this. Nobody knows Christopher Columbus anymore. So... Why don't you read his own books? You can read his own books. They're available. Read them. Read Christopher Columbus in his own words. Oh, he was a white European slave-owning uh, uh, Caribbean uh, massacre killing of the people. Nope. You might want to read who did that and how that came about. But see, Chris gets blamed for it because he was the leader. But what you don't know is that he turned around and dealt with those guys who committed mutiny and then pillaged everybody. There's a lot to talk about, but friends, listen. I'm going to pray that we either have a massive power outage so you'll be forced to read books again, <laughs> but dive into some great history. I'll give you a few. We're done. Time's up. I got 10 seconds. A life. Samuel Adams, A Life by Ira Stoll. Read it. 1776 by David McCullough. Read it. Forged in Faith by Rod Craig or Greg. Forged in Faith. Um, read this. Go to Anything by William Federer. Go to Anything by David Barton. There's so many more that I could point out. But friends, we need to we need to get back to the truth. Listen, uh, as always, if this meant something to you, press and hit the like button. Give us a five-star rating if you would. Spread the word, spread uh, the news that people can catch up here and now to what's going on. But as always, it's, we believe that it's time for us to live out what we believe in. In fact, we ought to live it out more courageously than ever before uh, because truth never wavers. And so it's time to live out what we believe in. It's time for real life. That's what we live for. So God bless you guys until next time. This Jack Hibbs podcast, as well as all the broadcast outreach opportunities, are listener supported. Will you consider partnering with us through a special gift? Go to jackhibbs.com to learn more and stay connected. Mm -hmm.